yo, 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 what's going on? It's the NOC, the Nerds of Color. And we are back with another show, pal, show. It's your boy, Kuya P, a.k.a. Patrick Michael Strange, the Adobro, the Babinka Boy, the leader of the Holla Holla homies in the center gang, gang of the show, pal, show. And today, again, uh, unfortunately, the amazing Ate's Cataphoric and Viva Valentina couldn't be with me. Uh, again, they're killing it. Cataphoric is now in Japan uh, per our last episode. She's now there because, you know, she's a teacher. And her goal was to finally get to Japan to teach uh, English to the amazing kids over there. And now she's doing it. She's living uh, out her passion. And, of course, Tina with Stuffy Spa, putting smiles on people's faces by taking those old uh, dolls that, you know, got a little worn out through the years and needed some new love and kind of repurpose it to make it exactly what you remember. Uh, she's busy with that work, but uh, we're going to, again, have them back as always uh, when their time permits. But I'm never stopping, y'all. I'm still going to deliver y'all show, pal, show. And uh, we have another amazing returning guest. Uh, we had her on to talk about her uh, amazing film called No Dogs. It's a short film about the Watsonville riots, and she's going to make it into a big full-length feature, which I'm super excited about. It's more of our Filipinx stories that need to be told. And uh, shout out to Randall Kamrat and Tangeline Bolton, who joined her as well, to talk about that amazing project. I'm looking forward to having them on again to share their individual stories. But today, y'all, I got Georgina Tolentino, back again we're gonna get into all of how she came to be how she got into the craft her whole journey uh we're gonna give her her flowers because they're so well deserved uh she's one of our great representatives of our people and of our culture so let me bring her on the screen right now here we go georgina tolentino you can unmute yourself georgina there we go. Horns blasting off you know how i do we're celebrating Welcome, welcome. It's a, uh, a pleasure to see your beautiful smiling face on this Friday. It's the weekend, so we can be happy about that. We can let our hair down now and just relax, maybe get a cold beverage and just chill out. How are you today? <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Water. <laughs> <laughs> Not wine yet. <laughs> Not straight vodka. Um, it's, it's good. Uh, I, I've been good. I think we're just talking, you know, it's really wonderful. We've got exciting stuff just the whole managing the world reopening. So yeah. it's all been really wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, film festivals, since we've last uh, talked, uh, you've been uh, on the road here and there, uh, kind of jet setting, meeting the people. What has the feed been back uh, about uh, No Dogs? And yeah, building out to your, your the, side the of feature. Town. You were on your side of town uh, a few weeks ago. So we had, last time we spoke, we were just premiering at the LA Asian Pacific Film Festival and you were so kind to get it out right on October 1st and to celebrate Filipino American History Month. And now we're ending, kind of slowly trailing off October. Um, and we are currently this week until Sunday um, at the Twin Cities Film Festival. So we can have add a link there if this is in time for that. Otherwise, there's um, the Philadelphia Asian Pacific Film Festival. And then we just had a wonderful screening a few weeks ago at the Chelsea Film Festival in New York. And we were so lucky. Um, the, the short film won Audience Award. So thank you, everyone, for voting. Yes. And also for the Petite Grand Prix, which is for the a jury award for Best Short Film. And it was so wonderful because I felt that a lot of people who responded positively to the short, uh, most people did, who were, who were not Filipino. And yes. I had someone come up to me who was from Bolivia and her her son was one of the directors of another feature, a short, short film. And she held my hand and she said, thank you so much for doing that short film and writing this story. She goes, I, I, I came here and I experienced that prejudice and that amount of hate and I just, she was crying. She started crying. She said, I just think it's important for my kids to know that we don't talk about it, but I think it's, I saw myself in it. And then shortly after, you know, uh, another man came up to me who was not Filipino. He, he just said, I, I, I want to learn more about Filipino American history. I, I didn't know this happened. And then this, this um, African-American girl uh, filmmaker as well came up and said, she wants to hear more, um, more stories about us. And and then this, 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 someone from Romania, a uh, family's from Romania said he actually had the signs because the signs said no dogs, no, no Jews, no Filipinos, no. And, and, and he said he felt seen. Mm. And that to me is so powerful and so important when 
And then we had wonderful people coming from Vons, uh, Kevin Nandel, who uh, was supporting us and brought his, his friends with him. And it's very important to see so many different people, Filipino, not Filipino, find a sense of healing and find a sense of relatability because that's art to me. You know, I mean, look at your wall. You have all these superheroes. They're not Filipino, but there's a, val- a certain level of value, values that they have that you find admirable, that's heroic. That is why these mythologies do well. I'm a huge Marvel fan. I'm the one who will go, maybe not as big as you, but but I will go to the midnight screening. I will go to the first opening weekend. I, I want to see him, I you know, and I my dad was a huge, he probably had what you had on your wall, but um, he, he's a huge comic book geek and he read me bedtime stories of comic books and the reason why i relate to this is because something like marvel and dc and comics have such a great um built-in audience and franchises behind it and why we go to it is because it's a similar thread that is within the films that we have is we're trying to show that universal feeling and, and marvel is about family you know marvel really is about showing the sense of your chosen family mm right? You have a sense of resilience and no matter what, you know, I'm going to, I can't, I'm going to butcher quoting Peter Parker, but you know, was it great power comes great responsibility. You got it. You got it. Yes. Great. (laughs) And that's exactly what being a filmmaker to me is. And, And being someone who is a storytelling creative, you have a responsibility to the world to share these stories and this power. And I do view it as a a superpower. Uh, And I think that's, what's really important is these things that were hindrances that could seem weak. Uh, I'm going to jump to DC, but like, you know, Superman with kryptonite, it actually, um, it would be really boring to watch someone who had no weakness. Right. But again, his enemies use it against him. And we have that with hate. And Mm -hmm. that's exactly what the parallels are, are, are told in these stories is it's not that much different from, from prejudice and supremacy and patriarchy. Uh, It really is trying to hurt people who are different. And Filipino Americans and people of color, we're those people. And I think it's really wonderful to see people have the same excitement and relatability as they do if they were to watch a mainstream film. So for me, that's a big win in my heart. And for people to feel that sense of, yes, belonging. And and it just inspired me to keep creating because that's what I want people to feel just in a bigger, bigger um, platform eventually, you know, with the different types of projects that I do. So Long answer to your question. Uh, it went very well in terms of uh, knowing that um, people want to see our stories. I love that. I'm so happy for you. I'm uh, ah, just I'm cheering you on from the sidelines. I, I love that we are now friends and I can see these updates and these posts on Twitter and Instagram um, uh, that you post and just everybody that I've had on Show Pal Show as well. That's, you know, why. Um, I do this, uh, you know, I, like you, an uh, actor, filmmaker for a long time. And uh, with pandemic, like, I think I told you, like when pandemic started, I'm gonna start telling our stories. You know, if I'm not going to get it, uh, if we're not going to get it on the big screen yet, which I'm working towards, and I know that's what you're working towards, in some small way, I can do it through these podcasts. And like today, we're going to celebrate and share the Georgina Tolentino story. And I'm going <laughs> to give you your flowers in regards to that. But uh, I I'm so thankful in, in, in that vibe and what I saw when I first had you on to talk about No Dogs and just, again, seeing your journey continued. Um, it's such, a, you're such a real spirit and you, that's what you're all about. And uh, I love it and uh, I adore it. And uh, so thankful for you because that's what's going to inspire the next generation. And with my daughter being a part of that next generation, uh, seeing someone like you doing that, uh, you're going to only make her better. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Salamat po, Georgina. Um, I love it. So uh, let's get on this journey. Let's tell the Georgina Tolentino story. I'm excited for it. I want to know how you became this amazing person that you are now that you are now and and that you're also still building. Uh, I I like to preface to a a lot of uh, the others. Uh, that have been on that we're still writing our story. I know I'm still writing my story. Uh, You know, I go on podcasts and people invite me to tell my what I'm doing, but it always feels like kind of awkward. So if you have some awkwardness right now, because I know you are still writing your story, you're you're becoming a filmmaker. Uh, we're going to celebrate. I, I understand that. We're going to celebrate that fact. And I love that, that you're still writing that story that's going to ex- inspire that next generation. But you've worked very hard right now to be where you're at. 
and there's somebody that's out there that wants to be where you're at. So uh, let's share the knowledge and everything that you've gained on this journey thus far. So, uh, but before we do that, uh, I like to take it back to the beginning. You've seen the podcast, you've seen my show. Um, we like to honor the people that came before and uh, kind of the playoff question that Tina asked is that, that stereotype question that we get, where are you from, uh, but where are your parents from? Uh, so take us back to uh, your parents, if you know their love story, or if uh, you know uh, even further back your ancestors, because uh, uh, we'd like to, well, I think, you know, again, that we're a manifest manifestation of our parents' dreams, the, 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 our grandparents, but the, the, the ancestors that came before them, because I'm sure there's a couple of things that you picked up that are what you're doing now and or maybe that they wanted to do, but because of uh, society at that time, no, you can't do that. You can't follow the arts. You have to do this. You know, they got kind of pushed away because of, you know, life. Uh, so let's go back to the beginning. Can you tell us uh, where are your parents from? Uh, you know, all of that. Take, take, take us back and then maybe sharing a little bit about the past, uh, about those that came before, before we go into your story. Uh, so yes, my, my dad was from Manila, <laughs> so from the Philippines, and my mother is from Nay Cavite, and they're both a little mixed. Um, my my f mother was more from the country, and my dad was more from the city, and I believe they met here when I, through my father's brother, his wife at the time was working with my mother at a store and I guess they were all hanging out together and my father met my mother and hit it off and my mother is very beautiful <laughs> she's still very beautiful till this day she's like five nine just very um she looks like a a, a, a hoppa mini driver <laughs> she's very beautiful and, uh, but she was also a very beautiful person. She's strong, she's sassy. And, and my father is um, a geek. Like he was a film buff lover and stories. And um, they settled down in San Francisco, uh, had me. And I went to, um, I went to grow up in the Excelsior district of San Francisco. And we didn't have much growing up. We actually lived in, um, I would say, a duplex, a very, uh, um, and it was just, I think really, it was a very challenging time because I realized my friends had all these, you know, beautiful houses and I went to private school. They put a lot of money into uh, going to Catholic private school. When did you um, get here? How old were you? When you I was born. born, I was born here. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. That's right. All right. So got, it. <laughs> got it. Got it. Got it. Uh, I was sorry. I was born in San Francisco and, got it. and, and I think, um, I would be so embarrassed to have people come over. I, I never was allowed to have friends over and um, they prioritized my education. Uh, and that was kind of, you know, what was really important to them. And um, I had grown up kind of being taken care of by my grandma and she, um, I noticed at around five or seven, you know, I was probably seven years old. She always told me she had bad vision. And so she'd ask me to, um, she wanted to watch VHS. I only age myself. VHS tapes, uh, and she she's like, oh, I can't see. I can't see this. Can you read it? So I would fanatically read it out loud, and then I realized over the years that she actually couldn't read. Oh and her, wow! Yeah, her her mother kept her at a certain grade level to take care and raise the other kids they had. And mm. she told me she's like, I always hated. She didn't tell me until I was older. But she said I always hated my mother for that. And she made sure every woman in the family went to school, university, every grandkid. And that's why she was in the U.S. She'd started catering and she would send money back to the Philippines so that her nieces would be able to um, finish school. So uh, that to me kind of was why it was so important for me to do well in school. And I became this straight A student and especially reading and, and writing. I naturally loved reading and writing because um, of my dad. He would tell, like I said, tell me all these bedtime stories and a lot of them would be mythology and, and Greek mythology and folklore and Filipino folklore. And oh, I just, you're getting that? That's Yeah, awesome. as my bedtime stories. Oh, wow. Yes. 
and also comic books. Then he'd go, okay, <laughs> Batman. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So I think it was really wonderful because uh, I had a sense of the foundations of storytelling and the foundations of mythology and, and, and comic books are mythology. Yeah. Gross. No barking, please. My dog. And so um, I felt comforted because <laughs> you see her. The yeah. <laughs> I love it. All part of our furry friends. <laughs> yeah. And um, stealing the screen. And so um, my parents actually both worked at night. Okay. And one of the things was, uh, my, we, we literally had only one bedroom. And so I would either leave in this, we would sleep in the living room or there until I was about in middle school until my parents decided to buy a house. But at that time I was really, um, like when they would go to work, we would go to sleep and it was very challenging because we would miss a lot of kind of normal American stuff moments yeah. with them because they had to work night shift. Yeah. Um, and I remember that kind of driving me to want to do very well, uh, in terms of honoring their sacrifices, you know, yeah. and we finally got a, a really great, um, uh, finally saved up for a house. We got it. And, and I went to public high school in, um, Thurgood Marshall high school in, in near, uh, Silver Avenue slash Bayview Hunters Point border in San Francisco. And, um, we have a theater there that that was slowly being renovated, but it, it's called the Little Hood That Could. <laughs> so, uh, and I went to that high school, and I remember I was a little upset because a lot of my friends were going to private schools, and private high schools were, I mean, probably the same price as university. Yeah. For some, in San Francisco, and so I kind of felt that, oh man, why can't I do that? And blah blah blah. So I went to that high school and um, the first week um, there was a, a really big, I believe it was a gang related fight where someone had brought a gun to school mm. and the, the SWAT team had to come. And I remember thinking we're on the news and here we go. Oh, here, here. It was so scary. We all had to leave. Yeah. And um, I was really shook by that because it was the reality. I think I've been kind of as much as, you know, I had other things. Uh, I was very sheltered for the most part. I yeah. didn't know what on earth that was. So one of the things that I, my parents are like, we can't move you. We can't change you. I was like, I want to transfer. This is blah, blah, blah. I said, no, you're just going to have to put up with it because we, we can't afford to send you to private school. We're trying yeah. to save through college right now. Yeah. So, um, meanwhile, my other friends were, you know, and I felt kind of, uh, uh, different, you yeah. know, just class wise. And so, um, I decided to stick it through. And I remember uh, people start, no one wanted to run for student government when I was 14. I think it was a freshman. And I said, why don't I go to this meeting? And I ended up becoming a secretary or something. Yeah. And then yeah. the year after that, I became vice president and then class president two years in a row. And a lot of that became from the same feeling that I have now is wanting to be a part of the solution of the problem. Mm. Mm. Instead of leaving this kind of thing, why don't I learn? Why don't I stay and go, you know what? How can I help my peers? How can I be of service? How can I make this better? How can I make this experience better in the next four years for all of us? And I got to meet other people who are the same way. I didn't go, you know, well, why is this happening? Why is this happening in our neighborhood? And yeah. as I saw this public school system, I saw that people were taking away arts and classes and, um, and, and AP advancement classes and sports because we were in a, considered an inner city school. And of course these kids were, you know, getting bored and, and being parts of these other groups because they had no value that was being given to them. Yeah. And I remember these very classes were being taken away, but these are the classes that actually got us to be qualified to go to university. And it was like, they were actually contributing to the problem. And throughout the years in high school, my teachers, I still think about them and I still thank them from my heart because they, they would stay an extra hour after they cut the honors classes and AP classes and teach voluntarily so that we can be given that class and wow. go to college. Yes. Mm. I remember all of them. And 
oh, I just, you know, that it was one of those schools that we always had to try 10 times harder than everyone to get something simple. Mm. And I remember I was 16 or 17 and it was like, I carried a lot. Uh, my friends were like, oh yeah, we're going to go we have a theater class. We're like, we have to create our own theater club. I have to run it. I have to do every single person. Yeah. These kids had to grow up fast because we weren't given these things naturally because a lot of the public school systems were based on testing. And yeah. if the students were scoring low, they would be given less funding. Mm-hmm. But I think that's the complete opposite. You should be given them more funding. So they would actually test higher because there's, there's other circumstances happening, especially in certain neighborhoods. Right. Yeah. And I remember um, just kind of feeling unseen by by the kind of and also even the, the some of the administrative changes in the school we, we had like four different principals <laughs> mm-hmm. and um a lot of the students and a lot of the staff had to really carry a lot more and teachers as you know don't get paid a lot and exactly. I re- remember admiring them for that but we all had each other and I think for me that's kind of the same dynamic that um I carry with me in my filmmaking and acting is Mm. I want to be a part of the problem. I want to be a part of the solution and being an active while still taking care of myself and my, my own personal needs and self-care. It, yeah. It's possible to really um, look at it as a more of a movement rather than some sort of hindrance or something that is, we're a victim to this. Yeah. You know, it's, it's an opportunity to change. And I kind of had to view that even as a kid and it was not easy. And I have to think, you know what? I have to become this person because I want to be able to give back one day to these kids, but I have to kind of be an example and prove and follow through and, and, and do that. And I think that's kind of what that feeling kind of awoke in me. And then uh, I remember I had a choice because I had gotten into um, a few U- UCs and I got into UC Santa Barbara. Oh, whoa, oh, ho, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Woo. Oh, I, I wanted to pause before we got to college. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> you are just rolling through. I, I love it, Georgina. <laughs> you are amazing, balls. You know what's up. Okay. Um, wow. Thank you, thank you for sharing all that. That's beautiful. And you're just you're you taking care of my job for me. I love it. Okay, <laughs> I don't <You're> know. Awesome. <laughs> um, oh man, uh, so beautiful, but also so sad. Um, that, you know, because of society and the way things were, um, just in a way you, you get robbed of your youth when you have to, at so young, you know, grow and you get, you, you just, you're, you're self-aware with this and it, it kind of robs you of your innocence in a way. Let's, let's be real. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, yeah. And I just, I, I, I definitely feel you in that I've had those different moments in my life. So um, with that being said, if you didn't have to do all that, what what were some of the other outside things um, just to just give a little bit more of the you, you know, obviously, you, you know, you were holding it down because of the circumstances and moving forward. But like, what what are just some of the crazy stuff that your parents would say about Georgina when they were home? Obviously, you didn't have that dynamic because of their scheduling. Um, what would, do you think they would say about young Georgina? Uh, my dad would have definitely said that I was fearless and like unstoppable and, and, and really determined. I think that was what he, but also he was also worried about me because <laughs> I was always, I was so jam packed and, and burnt out sometimes, yeah. but I think my dad really, um, admired that I was a go-getter, you know, and I think I was a go-getter for him because I wanted him to see, you know, I'm not going to let it stop me, dad. Yes. <laughs> he, he did write me a letter a while, um, when I was a kid and I was 13, I think. And he did it for my confirmation. We had a confirmation retreat. I'm Catholic. So we went to ca- confirmation and, um, and, and one in the letter, he said, when I was a kid on the airplane with him, when, when his dad had passed in the Philippines, we went on the airplane. It was me and him. And then my mom and my brother, my brother was a baby. They came later because it was too much to have all of us at once. There was enough flights. Yeah. And I remember it was one of the first times that he thought I was, I think one of the first times I was on an airplane, I was seven years old, mm-hmm. uh, without being a baby or remembering. And he said, it's going to be the takeoff. You're going to be 
it's going to be okay. But once again, the air, he's kind of calm me down. I think he was also trying to calm himself down because he's afraid of flying. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just looking at him. Okay. And he, he put his, um, as the plane's lifting off, he puts his hand on my hand. <laughs> and then I take his hand and I go, I take it off and I go, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man! And I said it so serious. Apparently, he just started <laughs> laughing. He's like this little kid. <laughs> oh, so cute! And I think that was still me today. <laughs> like I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cute. Uh, so, uh, what do you think your mom would say about you? Oh my gosh! <laughs> my mom is like the Filipino mom in Joe Coy's stand-up. Oh, word. Really? <laughs> <laughs> a little different. Uh-huh. Um, a little bit more of the dragon lady. Uh, yeah. She she knows I'm a go-getter, but she does, I think, find it very hard to find the realm of possibility for kind of the things I'm trying to do and achieve and the value. Mm. I think she would say, why aren't you a nurse? <laughs> That's what she would say. She'd just go, you know, I really wish you'd be a nurse. Right? The arts. <laughs> yeah. why, why do you get into the arts? It's not real. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. She's uh-huh. like, yeah, exactly. So it's not something that I think, you know, I was young. I actually drew a lot. I did art painting and stuff. And she was so supportive. My, my dad, both of her. But, but they could see it. That's the thing. They could see, oh, she could draw. Like yeah, she could yeah. actually physically has that skill. But acting is different. And it seems... Anyone, doesn't matter if you're Filipino or not, if someone's like, oh, I want to be an actor, like, Ugh. even actors' children, they always say it's really, it's really hard, even if yeah. you have family in the industry. So I think, I think she's not um, rare for thinking that. I just think it's, it's a multiple of different layers to it. It's it, acting in general is going to be difficult, being Filipina, being Asian, being whatever. It's, yeah. um, but I think, you know, she does know that I have a good heart. And that's what she always tries to um, remind me to kind of have boundaries with people. Yeah. Like kind of, a, yeah, sometimes don't have that. <laughs> ah, that protective. I, I, I feel that. I know that. I, I've been around that. Um, so uh, you said like you, 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 you followed again because you kind of you know, grew up a lot younger because of just of everything occurring and you focus on the academics. When did the love for arts uh, influence you? Did it start? Like, what were some of the early influences like to, you know, acting? Did you get into like a theater? Well, you you said, actually, you know, you, you couldn't because there wasn't no finances or else you'd have to start the club, right? Um, but like, yeah. what would you just do on your own? Like, what made you fall in? Did you fall in love with cinema? Was there like a particular film or, or a show that like, oh, I mm-hmm. want to do that? Like back in those days, even though you couldn't, you know, get the actual technical training you know, yeah. in like high school or anything like that. And maybe I don't, and then we'll get into when you actually got some of that training, but uh, when, when do you think you first fell in love with the craft maybe, or where, I, where you wanted to get involved with that? When I was a kid, as soon as I could watch TV and, and oh, yeah. um, so art in general was probably my, one of my first loves, I think painting and I do watercolor still, but, oh, you know, uh, I think I just loved being able to express myself without talking. I was very shy. Mm. And Tagalog was my first language. Oh, and really? I had okay. trouble. Yeah. So um, I, obviously I spoke English, but I wasn't, uh, and I was born in the U.S., but I, um, I had trouble with it. So I just didn't talk for a while. And I hated, you know, when they had those kids, the participation thing. I hate, I like, always struggled with that. So it's ironic that I do acting now, which is the complete opposite and so I was very shy and I was scared and, and, and the physical art was something that I could, again, communicate and express myself silently, <laughs> quietly, privately by myself. Yeah. Um, but I've always loved movies. There was something I would, I think, see very differently in movies. And I think one of my, um, I still have to find out what movie this is, Um. I think when I was a kid, I, I was watching it. It was about the, the civil rights movement and it was about segregated schools and water fountains. I have to find this movie, but I, I remember my dad was watching it, playing it, and I was watching it. And this white woman was so mean to this black girl and she wouldn't let her drink in the fountain. And I remember I was watching it 
it's so intently. And I just, go, I just go, I don't understand. I was sitting there and I go, why is she, I don't understand what just let her drink water. And my dad had to explain, he go, I said, I don't understand why she's so, she's being so mean. And um, then someone stood up for the girl trying to get water. And my, my dad said, this happened in a few decades ago. And um, people were a little prejudiced towards people who were different. And, and I couldn't go, what? I don't understand why she's different. I don't understand why she can't let her drink water. And he had to explain to me, it's because of people's um, skin tone and features. And we live in a country that is predominantly uh, led by a certain group. And I just couldn't take it. I remember I just looked so confused. And I think that was the moment that I realized, oh, is this what it is to live here? You know? And I remember that as a movie kind of opened my eyes. But my dad also loved Kurosawa films and I loved Kurosawa films. Woo! Those scenes on the rice that. patties, yes. And I think for me, it was, again, I don't, we don't speak that language, but you don't have to. And I think that was what so was, was beautiful about cinema. And I loved international film, foreign films, um, because there was other ways of telling the story, telling the feeling that you would feel universally. And there's a sense of poetry in those kind of films. Um, so that was probably one of my first favorite movies was the kind of series of the Kurosawa films. And then I remember watching um, Singing in the Rain. That was my favorite too. Oh, sweet. That's a sweet classic movie. And I would just watch all these, you know, these classic films with my father and we would actually dissect it together. And I think for me, that was what was really fun. Was we oh, just that's watched, super cool. And we would talk about it as if it was, we were, well, what did you like about the lighting on this? Well, I don't know. I think he was using blah, 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 blah. And we were just crazy about it because where we lived was so, it was hard reality, but the TV was something of an escape and also feeling the sense of connection to something bigger outside of our circumstance. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that feeling is something that I always fall back in love with and realize that's what I connect, connect to and tap into when I'm working, when I'm performing. It's that same feeling I, I felt since I was a little kid. It was sitting there going, I don't have this and I don't have that and I don't have this. But this feeling that I'm feeling that there's the person's going through in this movie is what I'm feeling. So it means that I'm, I, I can, I'm bigger, I can take up space. And so that was that love that I felt for, for storytelling. And then the comfort of when my dad had to leave to go to work, it was scary to be by yourself. And I, I had my brother who was a baby, like, not a baby at the time, but a little older. And the, the sense of storytelling made me sleep very well. It made me feel comforted and yeah, he just had so many different stories. And it, what, what one for a few months, I think we just had Greek mythology for one month. That was our lesson every night. And I just loved Greek mythology. And um, I was asked all these questions. And again, there are similar questions that I would ask in movies. He's like, well, why don't, why don't next week we watch so-and-so so you understand the story better, this movie. And I was become his little film buddy. And that was really fun. And so I think that sense of, safety and that sense of warmth I feel through storytelling is the same sense of I guess um something I want to hold on to in my work and in the kind of stories I tell I want people to feel that same thing so that's when the love started and in terms of taking acting classes um it was very interesting because I was very gawky I had braces and glasses and I was just very, again, very shy until I was, I'm still a little shy, <laughs> but not that shy. Um, I just was kind of bullied a little bit and made fun of because I was really dorky and like, I literally had glasses this way. I looked like a boy. <laughs> My hair was tied up in a bun. I was like very just not feminine, <laughs> but again, you're a kid, you know? But I guess since I was 13, when you kind of develop um, those kind of like, okay, identity and also just your relatability to everyone. Um, I remember a lot of guys would make fun of me and stuff. And I remember because I went to a Catholic school, we always had a uniform. And I remember wearing just 
dorky, you know, t-shirts and jeans and my sketchers and I wasn't cool. And I remember I actually ate in the bathroom the first day of school. Yo. Like I had no one to sit with. <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> I know. That's so relatable right now because that's what my daughter had recently been recently been doing. Um <laughs> that's a whole nother story in itself. She's she's not, she has a bunch of friends now, but that's what she was doing. Mm-hmm. So, oh. Tell her it's going to be okay. <laughs> um, yeah. And that was really, and then I remember I, come, I came home. I'm sure you, your daughter will relate and you will relate. My dad said, so how was school? And I just started crying. I was like, I don't have my friends. They're all at different schools. They're private schools and blah, blah, blah. And I just felt so like something was wrong with me because I had issues um, being, sh- I was really shy and I just couldn't seem to connect with people at the time. And I, I think for me, I wanted to hide because I was not very confident. I was still kind of coming in my own skin. And, and I was an awkward 13 year old girl with crooked teeth, and <laughs> frizzy hair. And I just didn't feel cool. I wasn't the, the popular girl with the whatever. And we all kind of go through that. So I think I just, I don't know. And I find jo- my old diaries. I found my old, old diaries and I always journaled. So I wish I could be, I wish I could be all this stuff. And, um, and then it did shift for me. I, um, remember I, the first year we had, we had our own version of like PCN, but for our Filipino club, we did plays that we had, we could write and perform. And I had one line and you couldn't hear me. I was so, um, just so shy. And then everyone made fun of not everyone, the people made fun of me after for it. I'm like, oh, you ruined everything. And she's like a bad actress. And I remember just feeling like, oh my God, I want more. <laughs> I want it. Hmm. It's like, let me run through the, the house on fire. That's me. Um, and I went, I know that I could do better. I know that there was a feeling that I felt being on stage it's that what a few lights that like you don't see anyone in the audience. It's all black. It's a feeling that I enjoyed. It wasn't about validation. Mm. It was a canvas. I felt for me, it was a, a place for me to play and, and explore myself. And, um, you know, and subsequently a few years, I, I, I kind of did it on my own too. I just got more involved, got more parts and, um, from our, our Filipino club. And, um, but I wanted to take acting classes. So, I, I think I did new conservatory theater in San Francisco. I took a formal acting class and then it came time for me to, um, go back to school and I would watch my other friends do musical, real musical theater, real plays that they could license and have these extravagant, they had a set building club. They had all these crazy things. Liz Miserables, they were doing Liz Miserables (laughs) and I'm over here writing stuff. I don't know. So it, it was just different. Um, and they actually had acting classes and we didn't really have that drama class, drama class was cut and we barely, they barely had a drama. There was like three people in there, I think. So there was just no opportunity to really act. And, um, but I remember watching other friends at their high schools and I would think, wow, I really wish we had that. I wish I want to do that. And so again, by that time, it was time to go to university. And I never really, I didn't really start taking acting classes until college. And then um, after I joined um, an acting studio and took formal classes and I told myself, I really, really want to get better and really want to improve. But again, the circumstances were a little different. I, my, I had academics, I had grades, I even had a job in high school and it was not really any time to like, water that interest at that time because I just had to focus on getting into college Mm. and then in college I did join um I take acting classes there anything that I could that was available to someone who wasn't a drama major I did plays and I just you know and um I just and I wasn't very good and I just wanted to get better and better and better and I just kept doing it It wasn't something that was natural um for me but I know in my heart I could do it. I think for me, I couldn't get past the shyness and being seen. Mm. I still felt like that girl with braces and glasses that people made fun wow. of. I still do sometimes. Yeah. 
The only difference is now I don't let it stop me from being present to perform. But before I did, there was that kind of block with, um, yeah. what if I get made fun of? Mm -hmm. I always had that feeling. Yeah. Oh man. All right. Let's take a pause there at that point. <laughs> and, uh, cause I want to like then go into that college story. I want to kind of stay, stay in this realm of pre-college. Um, uh, another important subject during this time frame. So we kind of saw that passion for the arts there and, and then obviously the academics to get to that next point. Um, but you grew up in America, you know, uh, Filipino, uh, find out, finding out that you're Filipino, you know what I'm saying? That, that, that awakening that, uh, you, well, you grew up in San Fran and there's a lot of Filipinos in San Fran, uh, but then, you know, uh, and I, we've had different people from the Bay Area that talked about, you know, their various areas. And some people didn't really experience, like, say, racism until they went to college or, like, became, quote, unquote, woke. What was like that for you? What was your story growing up in San Fran? But figuring out that you're Filipino, different. I, I don't know if you had, like, a lot of white kids in your school, but, like, you know, that you were Filipino. You were, and obviously you, you, you had Tagalog, which was, which we, you, you said earlier, and that kind of made things different and awkward, as you said because English wasn't your first language, right? So talk a little bit about that. When you, hey, I'm Filipino. And, you know, if, I don't know if you had white friends. For me, it was like, I, yeah, it was kind of like the debut. Have you ever seen the debut with Dante Bosco? Uh, it's something, to me, it's like a Phil Am classic. Uh, you know, yeah, we definitely watched that in high school. <laughs> right? Bring yeah. the white friends over. What's this wooden spork and spoon? What's this barrel, man? Why does it smell like... What's that smell? <laughs> you know? So yeah, tell tell me uh, the the Philippine X story of Georgina. Uh, in uh, I was very um, San Francisco is very uh, diverse, especially where I lived. So white people were kind of the minority. <laughs> um, but you know, uh, I went to I lived in an area where there's a lot of Latino, a lot of African American in high school, and Asian primarily, and and. I did have a best friend, Angela. I still love her. She's Italian. And I grew up with her and she was like an honorary Filipina. <laughs> she always, you know, always came over and my grandma would always feed her when I, you know, when I had the, uh, the house that she was allowed to come over in, or I would bring it to her. She always ate Filipino food. And then I would go over her to her house and um, accidentally had espresso <laughs> when I was 12 years old. <laughs> Cause her, her mother and her family's very from Italy. And, um, I, I think that for my inner friends that I stayed friends with, I didn't have that, that problem. They were, a lot of them had open hearts and that's what San Francisco is, I think. And her mother also grew up there. So she was very, you know, around different kinds of people. Um, I will say, I don't think I really experienced feeling different until, college. Mm. Uh, I went to UC Santa Barbara. We'll get to that in a little bit, but um, there was not a lot of us, let me tell you. Gotcha. And I will get to that later. But um, but, <laughs> but yeah, like you saw that film you said with your, your dad, right? And he kind of explained it to you. So like after yeah. seeing that, did like, was that the first time you saw it in, within film? Yes. Right? And then yeah. like, did it carry on after seeing that? Like, did you notice things differently after seeing that film out and about? I, I did. And I think I noticed it, how people also treated my parents at certain yeah. things or how they, they, they didn't stand up. So they didn't stand up so straight in certain circumstances, kind of apologetically. Um, and even how they talked to us, I think it was more of how they were explaining our place in the world, I think, than it was being by other people. Um, I don't really think, yeah. And I think a lot of that was, this is where these affluent people, whatever, we're not that. Just don't get the wrong idea. We're not that. And it just kind of, kind of stayed in that bubble. Um, and I think that was what was really frustrating for me was the case, like they put, they didn't do it on purpose, but a, a lot of people kind of put themselves in their own limitations. Mm. Um, and I think that was kind of a result of um that kind of uh, prejudice that was passed down was kind of fear-based. It was like, we'll just, you know. Um, and I noticed, I did notice um, more class differences than I did prejudice, I think. 
uh, yeah. growing up in San Francisco and San Francisco is a very affluent city. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, I, I think it was my realization with myself that certain things were passed down, you know, even just learning about your credit and learning about this and learning about that. Like it was so normal for other people and I had to kind of, you know, find other ways for it. So I think for me, it was more of a, a community um, a, a limitation and a, and a class difference that I noticed. Um, I don't think I experienced that much until later. Yeah. Ah, oh, you, I, I hadn't heard that word in a while, but class, well, classism, you know, uh, and uh, that crap. And I would say that's very prevalent in our crab mentality of our people. The Joneses, right? You know, keeping up with the Joneses and yeah. uh, that, because that was very much my mom. And that just like, yeah, kind of made me grow up a lot quicker, you know, with, with all of that, right? So, uh, whoo, unpacking a lot. This is like therapy with me as well, Georgina. Like, I feel yeah. you. Like, I know what you went through. I'm with you. Like, oh, <laughs> oh. I know. But it, but it gives us drive. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that That's what I think. And it helps everybody that's watching this feel seen and know and, and can relate. And mm -hmm. so just thank you for sharing uh, because a lot of us don't want to confront that or open to that. But I think strength can be derived from that. You know, I know because that's what's driving me right now by hearing that, like, oh man, it's just, I hate that. And I don't want anybody else to experience that, you know? And, and like you said it too, with your work, you know, uh, you want to change uh, with what you do. Um, so, all right, let's fast forward. Let's get to this college area and, and then, you know, uh, everything um, else amazing that you're going to do. Um, the, the 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 big thing that happens when it comes to college time, you know, is, uh, you know, the arts are okay. You can do that. But, you know, uh, academics is where it's at because you that, you know, they don't see that. Like you were saying, it's not tangible. Right. Mm -hmm. um, what were your aspirations? And then what were your parents aspirations? And then eventually going into where you would go. And, and then, then we'll get into that part of your of your story. Uh, I think. My aspirations in college were okay. So I got oh, into no, prior to college. Oh, like, I'm sorry. Prior, prior you, to, okay. Yeah, okay. What did you want to do before you kind of got pushed to go this way or to, to and to which school? You know, I wanted to be an interior designer, an interior commercial designer, and I think shout out to R two. <laughs> yes, <yeah>, sorry, <laughs> that's my uh, <laughs> that's my text. Um, and so I wanted to do something art related because for me and creative, because for me, I felt that that was a way for, for me to be creative, but also make money and be successful. And I had this fantasy that I would be living in San Francisco. I'd be doing commercial design for blah, 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 uh, all these buildings. And that's what I wanted to do. And, but then in the back of my mind, I always loved movies. I always loved theater. And for me, um, that's kind of what won me over. Something happened and, and I got um, pushed into the, the acting kind of bug and, and filmmaking. So for me, there was a kind of path that I was kind of set on. And I knew what I also didn't want. Um, I am still scared. I'm sorry if you live in the suburbs, <laughs> but it is like my mom's dream for me. And again, I'm not saying to anyone who has this dream, this is nothing wrong with, with this life and this lifestyle, but they always push like, you can one day live in this mini mansion and be a nurse and you can have all these kids and you, you know, blah, blah, blah. That, that was my mom's goal for me. And a lot of people's goal was to be just okay. Just okay. And um, I just, but I, every single time, I think I even thought about that. I thought, well, what about what's past that? What's past the little, you know, cul-de-sacs? There's a bigger world. What about Los Angeles? What about New York? What about, and I would always watch travel channels and lifestyle channels. Like, what about this? What about that? Well, I want to do that. What about this? Um, I want to do, try skydiving. I want to try this. I want to try whatever. Like I just wanted adventure. And I thought I didn't get that from the, the kind of, things that were being subconsciously passed down to me. It was a, it was a kind of fear-based scarcity mentality thing that was being told, this is what you're going to work towards. Okay. That's the plan. You're going to just 
Don't even try to get out of this box, girl. <laughs> you're going to stay and, and, and do that. And you're smart. You're graduating top of your class. You're supposed to do this. And I actually ended up getting into Berkeley. So that was interesting. Um, I got to UC Santa Barbara and I got to Berkeley. And my family was so happy that I got into Berkeley. I said, okay, why don't we go to Santa Barbara for spring break, my high school spring break. And then we go to Berkeley. We'll go Berkeley one weekend, Santa Barbara one. And we can, then I can pick. My parents are like, oh my gosh, she went to Berkeley. She told everyone that she got to Berkeley. She's Asian. She made it. <laughs> she freaking nailed it. <laughs> She's going to be in that mini mansion soon enough, guys. <laughs> And I can just coast. So that's what. I, <laughs> so I ended up um, visiting Berkeley. Obviously, a lovely school, number one. And when you get the package, by the way, the, the welcome package, you open it, and it's this really beautiful folder. And it's like this is the moment you've been waiting for. The trumpets are blaring, the horns or whatever. And they named all these instruments. I didn't know what the what the hell they were. <laughs> they were like this instrument's going off, and this one's going off. You don't know what it is, but if you go to Berkeley you'll find out. <laughs> it was, I'm like, what is this? And then this is what you've been waiting for. Welcome to the number one university in the, in the country and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to hide this for my family. I hit it. <laughs> I was like, oh shit, I want to go to the other school. <laughs> wow. Because I wanted to go to a university. I always wanted to live in Los Angeles. San Francisco is cool and lovely, but it is cold. And every single time we'd go to um, Los Angeles when I was young, I forgot that story. But when I was young, my aunt worked in accounting until she retired recently at Disneyland. So we always had these free tickets to Disneyland. We're very lucky. So we got to go and then I go to Universal. We could do all these fun things in LA, the weather, I just felt at home when I visit, when I visit as a kid. And even like, you know, if you did the little touristy lot tours, I don't know why there was something about it that just pulled me in. And I said, I need to get, I didn't get to UCLA, but I got to Berkeley and I got to Santa Barbara and I went, oh, Santa Barbara's closer. <laughs> so let me make my way to Southern California. I didn't know how to tell my parents, you know, even though I was doing these tours with them and they're trying to buy the shirt, sweatshirts. I'm like, hold off on the sweatshirts. Okay. I've made my decision. <laughs> They're trying to tell me of my decision. They're bribing me with a car. They're like, okay, you can get a car. I'll buy you whatever you want. Um, and I ended up, you know, visiting UC Santa Barbara's campus and I just fell in love with it. It was so beautiful. It was by the beach. It was so different. And there was a lot of white people, but I went, you know what? It doesn't help for me to not go here. It's going to stay white if I don't go here. And it's going to stay like whatever it is. And it was fine. I mean, it, it was a beautiful school. And um, I just I just thought it was a, a really cool experience. And Berkeley was great too. But I also noticed that it was really quiet when I was there. It was very quiet versus Santa Barbara. People talking to each other. It's very social. And I wanted that. I wanted a little bit more. And Santa Barbara is a party school. <laughs> but maybe I wanted that too. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But I, um, I decided that that was something I wanted to do. And I remember my, my family was like, oh my God, it's so far away. What's going to happen? What are you going to do if there's an emergency? Like, I don't know, fly, drive? Like, it's not that bad, you know? And there was all these things of trying to stay closer, into, closer to the area, but also go to a school that made them feel good and look good, you know, and kind of had this guarantee. But, you know, people don't realize this. And maybe things have shifted, but Berkeley is a very impacted school. And it's actually people end up graduating sometimes in five years and longer because um, that you actually can't take the classes you need because there's so many people and it's very competitive. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. But I realized at that moment, um, I was taking classes at nighttime for uh, other call for credit to get, be able to qualify for UC and whatever. I was burnt out at that time. And I realized I don't want to be an academic anymore. I want to do what I want to do. I will always be a, a life learner, but there's more to life than shoving my head in a book and doing a course that I don't really care about. You know, I really want to do what I want to do. Like I'm going to be 18. It's going to be my life moving forward. So I need to kind of do what's going to make me happy. It's going to make me fulfilled. It's, 
not it's I'm going to just form resentment if I do what my family wants me to do. So that was kind of my first step of rebellion. And I knew in the back of my mind, I'm close to LA. I've always wanted to be an actor, a filmmaker. Let's just get closer. Let's just have fun in college and we'll see how we feel then. So yeah, so that's when I, um, can may I begin my college chapter? Sorry, do you have any questions? <laughs> yes, yes. So let's yeah. go on this college journey into you rebelling and finding yourself and the arts and just, what do you think is the most significant change that happened? Uh, outside of that, finally deciding, parents, I love you, but nah, fuck this. I'm doing me now, like I'm here. This is the school I wanna be at. And you know, uh, do you, can you recall that? That, that, that telling them yeah oh yeah that yeah let's get that walks it out of my memory <laughs> i'm so scared i'm so traumatized i think it was you know i did tell them and it they for the even for the next few years they just said she's going to santa barbara but she got into berkeley she's going to santa barbara but she got into berkeley she kept telling have, everybody have that preface yes she chose the other one um but she could have gone you know, they, they said, you want your, I think at the end of the day, they said, it's whatever you want, you know? And I think um, that was, that was kind of what I appreciated that support. And when it was time I had, well, I, I had a debut <laughs> so that was before college. And um, Ironically enough, the instruments that were used in one of the dances, we did Sinkil. I did Sinkil instead of the traditional dances. And um, that was used for no dogs, the kulitang that I talked about. Oh, wow. But, yeah, that my dad got. And uh, now I have it in my apartment. And so as I go to college, you know, I say bye to my friends. And one of the things that I did realized when you asked me the, the, the question about prejudice uh, or did I didn't receive any was my friends didn't were very supportive, but I had one friend that I don't speak to anymore. Um, and she was not supportive of me acting. Um, and I remember that really hurt and it was kind of um, supposed to be her thing, you know? So anyone watching, oh. you, know, you know, that friend that's like, oh, it's my thing. Why are you acting? You're not even good. You're not even not to say she said that, but she, there was implying that, you know, I haven't taken classes. I haven't done this. I haven't done all the things that you're supposed to do that I haven't yet done to even, you know, do that. And so I think that was really hard. And that's what happens when you go to university. And even as an, as a young adult, these things that are, you're so used to since a kid, your best friends, they may not be your best friends anymore because they become different people. And these, they want you to stay the same and they wanted oh me gosh. to stay. Yeah. Right. They yes. wanted you gone through it. They wanted me to stay the girl with, behind her glasses. didn't talk with braces. So I would be the sidekick or whatever. It wasn't equal. And I've only still talked to one friend from growing up. I still keep in touch with some people, but my best friend and everyone else, I just, um, that was the dynamic when you, they want you to stay that, it's kind of a suppressed version of yourself. And so I remember, you know, going to college and my roommate, she was like the complete epitome of now it would be QAnon or something, but she oh was, gosh. she had an Ann Coulter book. Let me tell you, she was a huge Ann Coulter fan, super Republican, super conservative, nothing wrong with being, but, but she was, ah. Oh, she was my roommate oh. and we actually, actually oddly got along, um, tried to find that middle ground. I would just interrupt her and shift and change. And we tried our best. And she, she was, she wasn't, um, that's when she started making jokes. Right. And she would make jokes and everyone kind of just thought, oh, she's just fucking, excuse me, like this crazy girl in the building. Um, but we ended up you know, trying to find common ground. And that was very interesting. That was something I think important to learn because you're going to meet people who are going to be very different and uh, you're going to have to have, try to find compassion for them. You know, it would have been easy for me to get into go, oh, I don't fucking want to deal with this stuff, but this is, she represents a certain group of people. And I have to try to find my way into her heart as a human being to go, 
I'm just like you. I'm just like you. I have the same dreams and passions. And um, I've tried to bring out that side of myself that was the fun side or whatever, so that we can find other things to talk about because it doesn't, doesn't serve it, serve these people because they grew up in a bubble. So they go to college and then they don't know anything better. They're not interacting. So that was really interesting, you know? Um, and then, you know, through a call, you know, UC Santa Barbara became slowly became diverse. I think more diverse after I left, but I think at the time there was, there were some people there and I, I didn't really experience um, again, more classism and, um, people pulling up with their, you know, their parents, BMWs and, um, more of the people from orange County and kind of just oblivious, but, um, but it was interesting. Even people who I, I met in the laundry room who didn't know how to, to do laundry. And I would have these little flashbacks of me at the laundry mart with my family showing me and I showed them, you know, and it was like, just, it's not their fault. Yeah. You know, it's just, it is what it is. And just certain things that I thought were so different. I was kind of a survivalist because of <laughs> my parents. Going, okay, you're on your own. And I noticed all the kids were just like unaware of certain things. Um, and I was grateful for that. And I uh, had a great, you know, experience kind of ran into, um, <laughs> partied a lot, had fun, <laughs> but I think what was kind of, some of the moments that I realized, oh, I'm different was when I went to a party and one of my male friends, I went as his, and we never dated or anything, but I went as his plus one and someone said, oh, she's really hot for an Asian girl. Oh, fuck and you. Oh, that makes me so mad. He's like, yeah, you're, you're like, and then he said it to my face again. He said, you're very beautiful for an Asian girl. Like, you're just different. Like, I don't, I'm not usually attracted to her. He said, I'm not attracted to her kind. I, and I heard him. Mm. Yeah, because I'm an alien. Apparently, <laughs> that's the sort of creature from the night. <laughs> <sighs> so I have a lot I wanted to say, but that's when I felt really, um, yeah, different and, and kind of, uh, creepily objectified and it was a kind of a backhanded compliment um totally. and it was you know just that kind of uh when people find out you're kind of a little white they kind of find comfort in that mm. it's that one drop rule and i feel like it's really um something that has to sh shift and change but it also is not i think fair or accurate because we kind of exotify that and it's not healthy and also um doesn't make us equal to other women right i remember thinking oh god i can't believe this freaking guy and it was really just something i, I and i didn't really you know, okay continue with the party hang out with this girlfriend or whatever and um i felt i had won some sort of brownie points with this this creepy white dude um who just you know, had this prejudice and it was a lot of people coming from that. And maybe people thought that and never said it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know. We just say, you said it. A lot of people may think, be thinking these things, but that's, you know, other than that, I did meet some other wonderful people from, from all different backgrounds. And I had really wonderful roommates who were from different parts of the world. And I would go to, you know, everyone had cultural groups and I went to my friend's, you know, Russian party and like all these different Norwegian parties, like whatever, yeah. Yeah. Um, Latino parties, Filipino, Asian, whatever, yeah. Yeah. American, like it was very, uh, it was cool. It was a melting pot. But then again, there were people who, who just these select people that were raised a certain way and very sheltered and had that kind of um, entitlement that yeah. they're better and they're, they're superior and whatever. So that kind of, and again, I, that, that was not the last time I was, I've been told that, you know, and people, again, people think it's a compliment. It's don't ever say that. Yeah. But, uh, we're going to have a total mixed kid. Cause the majority of the, myself and the Ates, we're all mixed kids. We're hoppers and we're going to have, and we've had several hoppers on the show as well. We're having a mixed kid <laughs> unload session <laughs> that you're more than welcome to come and join us just, mm -hmm. just to like unpack that and just. Oh, it's so I know. right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, it's, um, 
I love that. Yeah. It's a very important conversation to have. And so um, I think, you know, in college, I still felt an outsider because I felt as though uh, financially some people weren't in better positions and all this. And then when I think it was my sophomore year, my, my dad was diagnosed with, with cancer and he basically, I had, was in a predicament where I had to possibly leave school and I couldn't afford the tuition. Like my, somehow something happened to my financial aid, it was whatever. And I, again, this battle of like quitting. And I was like, I'm not quitting. Like we have to find another way. Kindly enough, my family, someone pulled through and was able to help us out and all this. But um, that was kind of the, the moment that I felt I had to rush. And I had to grow up again. I had to grow up again, get a job in college, pay for some stuff. And then um, I actually graduated university in my third year because I was worried that I wasn't able to graduate my, my fourth year. And then I remember, I remember I had to take one quarter, uh, 32 units, which is a lot of units <laughs> apparently, because I think people were taking like 18 to 20. And some of the courses I was taking were, you were one day a week, but they were, um, more like essays you had to write like 10 to 15 page essays at the end or a large project. So I was able to fulfill that. And I remember my counselor was like, are you okay? Because this is a lot like mentally. And I remember I didn't really go out or party, but I just wanted it to, to graduate. Um, and I did in degree of art history with emphasis in architecture and I wanted to do interior design. But as my dad, you know, got sick, I realized to think, what do I want to do after? Uh, and I, I went, you know, and I think we get pressured to go, oh, go take care of your dad and stuff, but that's not what he wanted. So I went, I had to, let me just, why don't I just pursue what I want to do? I'm tired of being this person that other people want me to be, even, even in the, the selection of, of majors and all this. And I want, I'm just going to, I want to go for it. So I went, I'm going to graduate early. Not going to tell my parents, but um, in terms of that I want to act. I'm supposed to say, I want to move to LA. I'm going to move to LA and I am going to spend the first few years focusing on really acting the craft and getting a job and, um, and then seeing what happens. Cause I, there's something I can't shake. Uh, and at this time I started doing, I got an agent for, um, commercials and print. And I had actually drove to LA a lot to audition and uh, I got a little taste of it and I loved it. And I, um, and it wasn't about, I think I talked about this in Rob's thing is like, you know, you're young, you're like, that would be nice if I could, you know, get some attention and, and, and the, the, the kind of fun, the fun elements of it that come along with acting. But really what was it, what, what it was about was being free. I think being free to do what I want to do and express myself and, and take on a challenge. I mean, really, there's no one that looks like us that is uh, really in even 10 years ago, it's gone better now, but even 10 years ago was really pursuing it. So for me, I just said, you know, I'm going to go for it. Fuck it. Life is short. Excuse me. I don't know if you can swear on your show, but life is short. <laughs> I'm ex-military. I curse all the time. <laughs> life is short and you know, we got to just go for it. And so that's when I, graduated my parents came by they were um on filipino time <laughs> for the ceremony <laughs> i remember i was like losing it i was like you guys <laughs> and um and then the next day we went to the getty center the getty villa sorry here we drove to la just kind of felt it out and then um talked to my aunt and uncle my mom's side and they let me stay in carson and a spare room they had uh, until I figured out my apartment situation um, with some friends from college from the improv team from college that were moving that I didn't do improv. So it was interesting. Um, and so, yeah, that was kind of when, when that started and uh, it was hard. I was literally in my, my cousin's room full of pink, everything. And I had my, I didn't have a laptop. I had an iMac. So I had the iMac on the ground and I was looking for jobs and I, the first thing I did was sign up for an acting class. And I've been at the studio for a while, which is the Howard Fine Acting Studio, which is, I love. And um, 
I remember prioritizing that versus anything else. I said, like, I'm going to do that first. And Carson's pretty far. I don't know if you know that, but it's about a two hour drive from, from actual Los Angeles with traffic. And um, I basically just dropped off my resume in different places. And soon enough, in a few weeks, my friends were ready to kind of um, sign a lease for, for, an, uh, for a, a house that we all rented. And that's kind of when it started. I just, you know, um, ended up interning for a producer at the time that I reached out to um, at Paramount Studios. And then I had a waitressing job, which I hated and other nightlife jobs that I freaking hated. They were gangsta, let me tell you. <laughs> what I one time, I forgot what it was called. It was like the girls with the, the shots. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. When parties, when you have like, yeah. And bring it. the bucket of ice with the drinks and- um... Bottle service, but also- Yes, yes, yeah. bottle service. And we had got assigned to this one place. It was like a private party. I was like, oh, fuck, I'm gonna die. <laughs> like oh no and this girl we went in there and um she's like oh hell no like this is a gang and blah 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 I was like no we're it's not a gang like I'm now we're like okay we both put knives in our our freaking boots <laughs> that's how scared we were just in oh, case. wow and we were p- passed through security because they didn't want to ca- uh, really pat us down they're like okay whatever and it truly was it was a gang that I shall not say a motorcycle gang of some sort but um <laughs> We made it alive and I went, this is sketchy. Like we were going to random private like raves and parties and I didn't do that ever again, but I went, it wasn't a good feeling. It was like, this is what actresses go through when you move here and you have nothing. You're going to really, uh, it felt really demeaning, you know, and these were smart girls. She's like, I'm going to law school. You know what I mean? Yeah. She's freaking, we're packing heat in her. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So, you know, that was kind of, you know, what it was. It was, you had to use other elements to kind of make um, a living. And that was waitressing bottle service um, and then working a day job. And it was, I took, it chipped me away a little. It's not a good feeling when you know you're smarter, more intelligent and you kind of have to pay to put up with people. Yeah. Um, and so, I, I mean, I did that for a while and uh, yeah, it was really, um, frustrating but I ended up you know making a lot of really wonderful friends Mm -hmm. and um as I was doing that over the years I decided to start writing and producing and they were not perfect and they were not good (laughs) but um I also wasn't auditioning I was just I had an agent and a manager as soon as I moved out here and I met them through a photographer that I met that I was working with and they were legitimate, you know, producers and, and, and I'm sorry, managers. Yeah. And then one time they asked me, Hey, could you, um, chemically straighten your hair? My daughter does hair. Uh, I think it'd be cool if you straighten your hair and had bangs and were more Asian looking, could you change your net last name to more Asian sounding name? Because oh. using, oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I said, no. And this was interesting because I had really struggled with owning my hair. I have very naturally curly hair and I always wanted straight Asian hair. Yeah. And for the first, I was like, no, I'm not changing my last name. I am, you know, I'm Filipino if it's a question. Uh, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, why is it so confusing that I'm not, my last name's not Wu or something? Why not all Asian people have that last name? I had to exactly. kind of call them. And they went, well, we're going to, and then a few weeks later, they dropped me. Oh. And they said, you know, she's not going out. And then my my man, my agent at the time dropped me. And he said, your type is just not popular right now. <sighs> I know. And I remember I was just really upset. And I, I ended up having that. And I went, I'm going to just do my own thing right now. I'm going to do my own thing. So I started just kind of creating and writing and seeing what happened and, and taking it upon myself to feel expressed and you know it took a long time it's still taking time for me to even feel like things are happening but I think for me what what is really different from from that Georgina and my current self is uh I'm just giving myself room to make mistakes and learn and know that it's not going to be perfect exactly and I can't beat myself up from where I'm at where I want to be in that gap it's just 
a part of the process. And I, I think, you know, with anything, with any job, you just get better and better. And oh, yeah. um, got to get those reps in. Yes, exactly. And, yeah. and those muscles and that the, the skill. Exactly. So I think for me, I'm just always wanting to, even now I'm wanting to push myself even more and more. And so I think that's kind of the, the, the difference is allowing myself that space. And, yes. um, and here I am. <laughs> Woo! Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. We kind of went very quickly through that. And I thank you for just <laughs> sharing and opening up uh, because, you know, that's so beautiful. And it's, it's part of that journey. Um, but we went from college to then this journey in L.A., and through how to make it in LA. That's why I didn't want to stop you because I think that's so important. You know, it's not glamorous. It's it's a very difficult situation. I had friends to add to like the bottle service stuff. I had friends that became car import tuner models. I'm sure you know that as well. Oh, yeah. Those import tuner magazines and stuff like that. Um, yeah. But uh, the fact that you were getting into getting professional training now, you know, you were in school and you, you know, you, you had... Uh, you know, you were taking some classes there. What was it to like actually at Howard uh, Fine uh, and, uh, you know, the, the the different techniques, you know, uh, of acting? Did you, you know, because because this is one of your first, I would say, right, first getting actual professional training, right? What was that like for you? And uh, did it come easy? Were you OK with, you know, memorizing lines? Did, was there any kind of difficulty in like connecting with the character that you would portray? Is there like different genres that you prefer? What was that like for you? I think Howard Fine is one of the best acting, acting te teachers out there. He is just so spot on and I think very constructive. He, he's amazing constructive feedback. And that's what got me attracted to the principles that he teaches versus others because I think a lot of people so they're so long-winded and they just think want to hear themselves talk versus I feel <laughs> yeah and there's the kind of a, a kind of student that I think um stays dedicated to, to the studio that I was at which is which is um being on time I mean I was there because I was always there an hour early um no cell phones you turn it off or your, your cell phone goes off you go home he really uh wanted us to be very present and one of the principles that I really enjoyed was um, really the backstory and the technique was really uh, practical to me and, and straightforward and came from the heart. It wasn't so out there. And the technique that he used was the Uta Hagen technique, which is a little bit of you know, imagination and, and using yourself, which I think for me works. So, you know, I, I think why I felt really at home there was I wasn't naturally very good. I had a lot of stuff. I had no confidence. I was struggling financially. Um, and it, when you, when you're in that position and you don't have that space, it's very difficult to perform when you don't feel good about yourself. You know, you're using yourself and you don't feel good about yourself. It was really hard. And also, um, I just, yeah, I just don't think I explored some of the characteristics about my past and like owning my, my stuff and healing it as much as we're talking about right now. And that can really cause a hindrance in your kind of artistic growth sometimes. So for me, you know, uh, I wasn't, there wasn't, there was a lot of levels to the class. You started, you do technique and then, you know, there's a master class. Um, but what I really admired was a lot of the exercises that we had. And a lot of it was, for example, the phone exercise was you basically replicate a phone call that you had earlier that week. And it's so you are bringing yourself to the work. Um, and one of the other things that I really appreciated with him was one of my challenges was verbal will. I was very quiet and it was that quiet teenage girl coming out again, or I would talk very quickly, which I'm still working on. So that was an indicator that I was not allowing myself the space for me to take up space. I was rushing through it. And I wasn't projecting. And the word projecting is, again, it wasn't necessarily shouting. It's more being intentional. It wasn't coming from here. When you really want someone to hear you, you will make sure you are clearly understood, just as I am speaking right now. And so owning my voice was one of the biggest things I learned in that studio and that I take today with me and that I constantly work on. Because when I was a kid, 
I was made fun of speaking, right? Because I didn't speak English very well. And I had issues being seen, which always came up. So I think for me, once I learn that to own my voice, that the, the situation is bigger than my stuff and to be fully present, I think I was able to, to truly shine and like even still connect better and use myself. And I think even, you know, losing a parent and seeing his health decline, he, he passed away a few years ago. It completely opened up another door of emotion that I didn't think existed. Like I think acting is, oh my gosh, I'm going to play another person. It, it's you're actually just exploring another side of yourself because we're, what I loved about his teaching is we're all, he always says we're fully capable of, of everything. Like we're just brought up in different circumstances, but we as human beings, if pushed the wrong way, the wrong time, the wrong circumstance, we're fully capable of all these things. Right. And so that was one of the things I thought was very fascinating was just the more I learn myself, the more actually can, I can actually be of service in my acting. And when, when I was grieving, it was just so many levels, but I realized that I'm not alone, that other people go through this. Unfortunately, it is something we go through in our life in different variations, but it allowed me to understand what's at stake, what's at stake with life. And what's at stake with my personal, you know, future and all this is that life is really precious and should just be talking to someone one minute and not have them the next minute. It's so horrible. And someone that was such a big influence in my life. So for me, you know, acting is really exploring different parts of myself, but also honoring my father and, you know, the kind of person that he saw me to be. So me really stepping up to the, the plate and being that person that he saw that I could be is really something that I think I, I take with me in all the pieces of work that I do, whether it's related to him or not. It's just knowing that um, it's something that a way for people to know, get to know who he, he is, you know, in my work. So I think for me, that's how I approach acting. It's, it's, it's gotten deeper because of what I've gone through the more stuff and and life that I experienced, the more I actually am able to relate to people about loss. Girl, I I was starting to feel like some tears coming out of these eyes, (laughs) looking at you, (laughs) thinking about my past, thinking just everything, just that's what this, these interviews do for me. And uh, thank you for sharing that. And uh, yeah, uh, that resonated uh, real quick. Um, So, yeah, all these life experiences, you know, as actors, creatives, filmmakers, we put into the work. And uh, so when you put in the work, yeah, it's whew. anyway, I'm rambling now. Um, so you're putting in the work. Uh, you're doing what you enjoy. You you love this craft. It's uh, it's a craft to you. It's not just whatever. It's it's your heart and your soul. And you sacrifice so much to get to these points and, and to be and do this. Um, and, uh, you had people that believe in you and shared those moments that inspired that and, uh, rest in peace to your dad. Um, um, so doing it, there's a lot of no's that come along with this and you have to love this in order to pursue this. There's more, you, you know, you, like you said, you're auditioning and you're still working this job to, in order to do that. And, uh, but yet you still do it, even though we're going to get 75, 85%, 95% of the time knows um but you just keep doing it um how has that been for you and just what do you do and then obviously you've channeled into writing and producing uh and finding other means because that similar to my own story i got typecast you know the i'm the go-to asian guy here but then when i had a bald head oh he can be african-american he can be hispanic you know yeah. why don't you change your name i got that too uh all of that what was that like for you on uh, from a female perspective mm-hmm. on your side and in LA and getting these no's but still striving and then but maybe working these other angles to continue to follow this pursuit and dreams and which led you into writing and producing um I think one of the auditions that when I had my agent and manager at that time I have a, a, a great team now but um at that time they went, oh this is the biggest audition for you blah 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 and I got it. And okay, cool. Oh my God, it's a it's blah, blah, blah. He's a big, oh, he did this other show that I like. It must be a good show. Started reading it. And the scene was, I was an Asian mistress. 
and the mother-in-law catches me having sex with the main protagonist's husband and pulls a gun at me and says, move it, Sanrio, your people built the railroads. And my character's backstory was to want more plastic surgery. I was just being an, um, a nanny or whatever, like a, a maid or something because I wanted breast implants. And it was a comedy, but even I thought that wasn't funny. And where I auditioned, I remember, and I remember I felt so weird putting like a freaking gel inserts in there and like showing up. And I, my dad was like, how did the audition go? And I didn't tell him what the audition was about. I was so embarrassed. And I was like, it went well, but I was crying. I was so upset and I just felt disgusting. And I just felt at the time really heavy. And I just don't want to, I don't want to, here I am at this other place being able to perform and act and doing plays and all this. And my race doesn't matter, but when it does, why does it make me feel bad? Mm. Mm. And I just hated that feeling. It made me start hating the industry and I hate myself, you know, what there has to be something better. So for me, I started, you know, really looking into and, and, and all these other stories started finding me as well. And I want to pursue that. And I'm, I'm still, and you know what? And it didn't go perfectly. I'm still in the process of all these other projects. But auditioning at that time was really hard. And even I would get these other auditions and they weren't very good. It would be once or twice a year if I'm lucky. And it would not be for um, Filipino roles, which again, necessarily, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that necessarily. But uh, it is weird to play other ethnicities. There is a sort of um, backlash you will get as Asian people. American that that sometimes I don't think casting or producers really consider they're like just work you know um so for me it's gone a lot better in the past year and a half I have I'm auditioning a lot more and it's almost 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 <laughs> there's a lot of almost just a little frustrating but I think you know what's been really wonderful is uh I actually enjoy self-tapes a lot more than I do show in, in person because I feel as though I'm not as distracted by the other things going on and I don't myself, I'm not paying attention. I get in my head. Um, there is kind of silver lining and uh, benefit to kind of being able to do your own kind of self tapes. So it's gotten a lot better. And I also started just in the past year and a half, just with friends with the shutdown, um, just creating little scenes and, and things. And one of them happened to be no dogs. And the other ones were for fun. And uh, it's just, I view them all as practice. So for me, you know, it's how I feel about myself and how I feel about the industry that I think really is going to dictate where I um, put my energy and time to. And when the auditions happen, it, I'm more, I'm, I'm more present because I don't, I'm not as needy or need validation from whether I get it or not. The more I think open and loose I am, the more I actually, um, I think I'm, I do a good job because I, I, don't, I don't, I'm not so desperate on screen. I'm just, okay, I'm just going to, I'm going to do it. I'm going to be present. I'm going to focus on the work. So I think there's been a lot of wonderful, wonderful opportunities that have been popping up, but in the meantime, you know, I'm always going to create, I'm always going to write, I'm always going to be collaborative and be in getting a go, putting the energy out there. Yeah. And when, you know, some of the people that I admire are, I love Britt Marling. I love Lena Wave. I love Issa Rae, the kind of um, multi-hyphenates that they are. Yeah. I think it's really cool. And that's the kind of um, performer I want to be. And that's it. Because <laughs> other people don't necessarily have certain privileges or, you know, if I'm going to wait around for a role about the Watsonville riots, bless my heart, I'm going to be a hundred <laughs> if I'm lucky. Yeah. So you have to just create it. And this hasn't been new. You think of yeah. even Ben Affleck and Matt Damon when they did Goodwill Hunting, you know? Exactly. There's so many things that I think as creators, as entrepreneurs, you have to take charge of. Yes. This whole idea, oh, it comes to you. It doesn't not come and no one's coming to save you. Let me tell you. Exactly. <laughs> no one's coming to save you. But the more I put the energy out there, the more that people get to see, oh, this person has this desire to work. Mm hmm and they're active and the train is moving with or without me being involved. And that's yeah. attractive to people. 
Love it. Love it. Control your own journey and, and, and make it happen for yourself. And there's going to be stumbling blocks as you're doing different things. Like for myself, actor, then got behind the camera because I was getting <laughs> typecast and just, just, and keep it building and just keep, oh, I love it. Um, but it's also, uh, but also, yeah, it's hard. It's, it's, ah, uh, Georgina, thank you. Thank you for sharing all that. And like, I was getting a little sensitive and emotional and I, I see it too in your face and you're reflecting and that's, uh, all, it's all part of this. And uh, I hope you're taking this as energy is, uh, where, how, you know, the sacrifice and the work you've put in and just how important it is to just continue and continue building and, and making things happen. Uh, you got people in your corner. I, you've got a friend over here, a friend here, uh, a, a creative here. Uh, that's working towards this together and we can, you know, uh, build and, and continue building. Um, as I was looking into uh, your website, uh, one of the things uh, that I, I thought was particularly interesting, I'm not sure where this stands. And, and then as you were saying, you know, because we are in COVID times and things have adjusted a bit, but I saw that uh, Victoria Manalo Draves, uh, a biopic you were uh, cast in. I, I don't know how that's, and how that's working out. And I see that you've been training for that, uh, two years in diving, gymnastics. Um, <laughs> what is going on with that project? Or is that, was that completed? Or was that still in the works? It's still in the works, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> but oh. it's been, uh, I've been a little busy with, um, I think everyone has been kind of just getting their bearings together with okay. everyone's, um, I mean, COVID was really hit a lot of people personally and financially, yeah. and I think, People kind of had to kind of readjust to that and regroup. Um, but the positive is that we're in a very different time right now with diversity. And it's interesting that even this project with the Watsonville riots was actually supposed to be a, a scene sample for that project. Mm, wow. <laughs> it wasn't really uh, something I wanted to explore until I got more information, more information. And um I think that there's a really exciting time for for projects about us. Yes. So for me, you know, I think I have faith that no one's ever going to tell it the way you're going to tell it. No one's the no one's ever going to tell it the way I'm going to tell it. And I know my value, and that's irreplaceable. And that's all I'm going to work with. And I know. And when, when I, I noticed that even with the, this project is there's a certain level of, of, of love and heart and you can't teach that. Yeah. You can't, you can go to film school, you can go to business school, whatever, but there is a special love that I, I personally have with these period pieces, with these stories. And um, I think all I can say is that I really fully commit to it. I really commit to it. And I think it can be very challenging, very hard when you don't necessarily have all those resources immediately. And there's a lot of human mistakes, human error and, and life happens. And, and, you know, I think the exciting thing now is that um, there's an interest in these projects and I'm really excited to be a part of it. I'm really excited to, to be moving everything forward. So I think all I can say is um, just wait. <laughs> I, I saw that in your bio and I'm fascinated because I wasn't aware of her. So it makes me want to dive into that history and uh, learn more, you know, just like you're doing with No Dogs and how are you inspiring people at these at the recent film festivals and how these other cultures now want to learn our stories. Uh, I love it. And as a Filipino myself, not knowing Victoria Mano Ladrave's story, uh, wow. And, and seeing the elements that she's a swimmer and everything and going back to earlier when we were talking about Marvel, you know, there's a Filipino superhero called Wave, right? And Georgina, I know you're, you're a little bit of a Marvel fan. What up? Um, <laughs> you know, hey, you, you, you're putting in that training, girl. <laughs> you know? I know, you know, I think, I think it's really exciting. It's an exciting time. And I think one of the things I'm just, I'm really focused on is, is working. It's just working as much as I can to put yourself, put myself out there in terms of the kind of work I can do. And, and not just the stuff I'm, I'm doing on my own, because it's great to do that, but being a, a, objectively being a working actor and yes. having people allow you to, um, you know, just have your work seen in mainstream is very important. And, and there's been a lot of opportunities. It's just, I just chant for the day when there's going to be an aligned time because um, yeah. 
I see a lot of Filipinos getting cast and I'm very happy. Yes. But, you know, I think one of the unique things is there's always a certain um, essence that they're looking for. Yeah. And I have my own that I carry. You know, mm-hmm. I think I carry that with Marisol. I carry that with the other project I'm doing. But, you know, I've been told I'm not Filipino enough for certain things. Oh, and girl. Or you have been too, you know what I mean? So I'm just saying, you know, there is a certain, um, you never know what people are looking for and has nothing to do with talent. It just yeah. has to do with maybe matching it with the other person, with a certain person that they know growing up that they wrote it based on, that they're trying to look for that, that person. Yeah. And so I don't, I don't take things as personally because um, there's just, there's just something that we all have to know that with art, even big name actors, they don't get cast for everything that they want. Exactly. For whatever reason. And um, you kind of, we kind of have to view it as an opportunity to go, you know what, it, this is part of it. This is kind of part of the role of the dice. You know, we just have to kind of play, but um, all I can do is keep creating work and uh, opportunity for people to see my work and, and see what happens from there. Boom, that's like a drop the mic moment right there. <laughs> but ow, there you go. No, I love it. Georgina, you are amazeballs. I, I love your spirit. <laughs> I love your vibe. I love your energy and your desire and, and all the reasons that you're doing it for um, that you know we've discussed this entire time. And uh, no, I love that. I appreciate that. And uh, mm, 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 just, uh, whew. Yeah, uh, I, I love it. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, all of that with me. And uh, I look forward to us continuing to build, you know, we're doing it individually, uh, but I hope it can make us meet on a set and we can work together yes. on anything and just make that happen um, because my goal is the same. And uh, I love that. And I want to share that same camaraderie, that same actor family, that same production family with like-minded individuals. And so, uh, you're amazing. I appreciate that. Um, my ve- my final question before we get up out of here uh, is uh, again, we're the nerds of color, and our W nerds rule the world. Show pal show is uh, if you and I think did we do? I don't know if we did this during the no dogs out, uh, no dogs allowed. Uh, oh my god, I can't even talk anymore. It's been a long day. Uh, your film, no dogs. Uh, if we get the nerd talk question, uh, I think we did a little bit. So. I'm, I have to bring it back. That's how we end it. Uh, if you had to give a nerd style TED talk on anything, don't bring back whatever we did. Although you, I'm not remembering it right now if we did that or not. I think we kind of did. If you had to give a TED style talk, give me something different. Oh, um, yeah, I like that one. <laughs> Weren't you we're like Harry Potter or something like that? I think I'm remembering it now. No. Or was it Harry Potter? What was I wasn't it? Harry Potter. Um, even though that is something I could do. Um, I, <laughs> it was a TED talk on comic book characters, fighting style, and how oh. certain martial arts were in. That's pretty cool. I think that's fun. I love to do that. But, a, oh, a TED Talk. Okay, Give me something new. Give me some new. Manifestation. Using your cultural heritage and your ancestral lineage to um, make things happen in your life that you want. Mm. It's another thing I'm very interested in. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. I love it. Georgina, how can uh, all of my friends, they, they, you said it before, but your, your, your socials, how they can follow you, subscribe to you, reach out to you. I'm going to have it in the description below. But for those audio listeners, how can they hit up Georgina Tolentino? Um, for Instagram, Georgina Tolentino. Uh, Twitter, I'm barely on there, but Georgina TOL. And um, you can follow No Dogs Film. And then, you know, we are at Twin Cities this weekend. I don't know if we'll have this on time. Well, uh, if you missed us this weekend, we will be at the, the Philadelphia Asian Film Festival. So if you want to watch our short film, definitely take a look for that. And then we'll keep you posted on the progress of uh, the larger project. There you go. I can't wait. Looking forward to it. We'll support in every way. Want to have you back as that comes out. Shoot, I want to, like I said, I want to be involved. I want to do whatever. You're going to be can. in it. Don't, let me tell you, you'll be in that dance hall making that. I will see. be there. Like, <laughs> uh, that's the plan. 2022, we'll be out of this pandemic. There's a lot of LA trips. Cause again, like we're talking, there's kind of a Asian API Renaissance, especially us in our Filipino community. We are building, we are talking. There's a, I think the crab mentality is starting to fade away a little bit, at least I'm hoping. And we're communicating, we're working and we're building together. Uh, Yeah, there's a lot of beautiful stuff in the pipeline. And I know I have stuff I have in mind for you as well, homie. I'm not gonna lie. There's things, you know, we're all developing, we're building. And uh, as it goes along, then we'll get 
people involved and I'll reach out and everything. Georgina, all the best. All, the, all my love, Mahakita. Uh, <laughs> for your boy, Kuya P, we're just going to sign off because we don't have the rest of the Ates. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's the legend Kuya P on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. Of course, the Nerds of Color, Show Pal Show, and at the NRW and Annual release Wednesday, where nerds rule the world. For Georgina Tolentino, please follow her. Show her all the love. Let's continue to support her and give her love and light. Uh, your boy, Kuya P. NRW, show pal show. Yeah, man, I'm, I'm getting lost. We got to get up out of here. We love y'all. Mahakita, salama. Until next time. Thank you. There we go. <laughs>